Okay, good afternoon. While you're all getting settled in, just a reminder that uh, after this lecture, as always, there are cookies and snacks down the hallway. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's wall speaker, Dr. Barbara Meyer. Uh, having worked in worms for many years myself, I've been fortunate to have a front row seat to kind of watch uh, Barbara's remarkable research accomplishments un unfold. Uh, for the past two decades, Barbara's group has essentially single-handedly and from scratch uh, focused and discovered the mechanisms underlying sex determination and dosage compensation. Her work is um, characterized by being both efficient and flawless in approach. She exploited the genetics of the C. elegans system to identify many of the genes uh, involved in the processes, many if not most. She then turned to take advantage of the molecular, cellular, developmental, and most recently genomic tools available in the worm to really tease apart the molecular mechanisms by which these genes and the encoded factors do the fairly remarkable process of counting chromosomes, distinguishing autosomes from sex chromosomes, and then identify and specifically regulate the sex-specific chromosome gene expression to a level that allows the different sexes to maintain constant expression even though they have different doses at the sex chromosome. Although focused on primarily on dosage compensation and sex determination, Barbara has a long and consistent record of novel discoveries that shape our very thinking of fundamental aspects of chromosome biology. These touch on such things as crossover and recombination during meiosis, mitotic DNA condensation and segregation, and more recently, the long-range control of gene expression. Barbara's career path is as impressive as her research accomplishments, starting out as an undergraduate at Stanford, getting her master's at UC Berkeley, then traveling to Harvard during her PhD working with Mark Potashny. She then ventured across the pond to the MRC in Cambridge to learn about a newly emerging model system called C. elegans from the father of C. elegans genetics, Sidney Brenner. Barbara started her independent research career by accepting a faculty position at MIT, where she quickly rose through the ranks and achieved tenure. In 1990, she decided to move her research group to the University of California at Berkeley, where she remains today, in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. In 1997, she was uh, selected as a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 2000, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the list of honors and awards go on for there. Today, Barbara's going to tell us about chromosome connections that are required for gene expression and crossovers. And having had the pleasure of hearing Barbara talk many times in the past, I can tell you you're all in for a real treat. So please welcome Barbara Meyer. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I've seen so many of my friends from the past, people who taught me in my days of Lambda how to think about science and, and were the great inspiration for all the experiments that I did and really have done recently. I think that training was invaluable and many of you are in this audience and I'm grateful to you. Today I'm focusing my talk on um, basically chromosome structure and the many different roles that that can play throughout development. Um, the title is Creating Intimacy and that's kind of a joke to myself because everything in life is about intimacy and it was fun to find that this was an essential feature of my, um, my uh, research as well. So as Mike mentioned, we study many different aspects of biology, not because we tried to, but because as we did genetics, we stumbled across various phenomenology that we decided to track down to molecular resolution and that brought us into many different areas that we really didn't expect to be thinking about. So we, we started by trying to figure out how the worm counts the number of X chromosomes to determine sex. I don't know if you can see this. Is this too dark? Okay. It's so bright here, it's dark there. So we, we, um, our first question was how the worm counts the number of X chromosomes. Hermaphrodites have two Xs, males have one. And that was sort of a daunting task because we realized that that developmental uh, control switch um, might control a separate process, namely the process of dosage compensation. But at the time, dosage compensation hadn't been described for the worm. Um, and so we really started our research by trying to figure out whether worms were like humans or flies 
in that the imbalance in X chromosome dose that is created by the basic sex determination mechanism itself uh, is corrected by a chromosome-wide mechanism of gene expression that allows uh, males and hermaphrodites or males and females to have an equal level of gene expression. So we started actually by determining that there was such a phenomenon and then realizing that that's controlled by the sex determination switch itself, which then led us to work backwards to try and define what exactly this counting mechanism is and the signal. Unfortunately, I won't have time today to tell you this mechanism, and what I want to focus my attention on is more how you regulate uh, expression of an entire chromosome, and how studying that lets you think about questions like, how do you regulate where you place double-strand breaks on chromosomes in order to have crossovers? And it also led us to try and figure out how chromosomes um, stay together after replication through the process of chromosome cohesion. So these are all interrelated processes because many of the molecules we discovered in dosage compensation play these other roles in the cell. So even though these questions seem to be unrelated, they're actually extremely related by a common set of molecules. Okay. So the very process of dosage compensation, as I described, is chromosome-wide. It's imposed on all the genes or most of the genes that are located on the X chromosome. And uh, while there's a process of dosage compensation, the normal regulation of those genes that occurs, a temporal regulation or sex-specific regulation, has to still exist. And so the mechanism we describe um, is in addition to that. So in C. elegans, we showed that the mechanism of dosage compensation works such that a large protein complex binds to both X chromosomes of the hermaphrodite to downregulate expression approximately by half from both X chromosomes um, in this animal. So please note that this is not X inactivation. It's not that a single chromosome is repressed fully. Rather, both chromosomes are dictated to turn down expression by about half. That's a hard problem to think about. In the male, this dosage compensation complex is not allowed to bind to the X chromosome, and hence the male is passive in this process. And so both X chromosomes of the hermaphrodite have to be repressed by half, approximately. So what is this complex of proteins that does this? As, as Mike described, we first uh, defined these by genetics and then molecular biology, and then did biochemistry, I'm stuck, <laughs> biochemistry, to figure out what this protein complex is. And remarkably, what this protein complex is, is uh, a core of five proteins. These five proteins um, are the homologs of a famous condensing complex that was being co-discovered by Doug Koshlin and Tatsuya Hirano at the same time we were defining the dosage compensation complex. This condensing complex is composed of these two large proteins, these coiled-coiled proteins that are ATPases and these um, three other proteins. And together, this large complex of proteins binds throughout chromosomes to compact those chromosomes in preparation for the divisions in both mitosis and meiosis. And so it was pretty surprising and pretty intriguing that a chromosome-wide gene expression mechanism would use a similar set of proteins for a very different task. Well, worms are smart. They had to steal this ancient protein complex and drag it selectively to the X chromosome. And to do that, the worm managed to create these other proteins that are the recruiters, the loaders, of this condensin-like complex selectively onto the X chromosome. So while we were trying to figure this out, we noticed that several of our genes um, seem to have phenotypes in meiosis. And these proteins, we later learned, are really important for crossover control. And um, our analysis of crossover control sort of came out of trying to figure out chromosome structure and what chromosome structure might have to do with um, dosage compensation gene expression. Okay, so not only does our dosage compensation complex have these condensin-like subunits and the loaders of the dosage compensation complex, which are actually uh, under the control of the XA ratio, the sex determination signal, we discovered that there is another molecule called dumpy 30, which is part of this complex. And this molecule is actually part of a separate activating complex, a complex you might know, the compass complex. This complex is responsible for trimethylating H3K4, um, and it's um, correlated with activity of genes. And so the fact that the same molecule is both in a repressing complex and an activating complex was also intriguing to us, and we wanted to figure out what this molecule was doing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a while. I think more remarkable was the finding that as we started doing the biochemistry in the worm to figure out the protein complex involved in dosage compensation, 
And as we were trying to figure out the roles of these proteins in particular, we began to discover that there are multiple condensin complexes in the worm. There are three of them. And they are all specialized for different roles. The even more remarkable feature is that these different complexes all have a similar um, set of proteins. In fact, they're mixed and matched. And when they're mixed and matched, they have different functions. So if you look here, there's this complex of proteins that's called condensin-2. This is actually the major condensin complex in C. elegans that's responsible for compacting chromosomes in mitosis and meiosis. Yet it shares the subunit MIX1 with the dosage compensation complex. In fact, MIX1 didn't come out of our original screens because it's lethal to both sexes and we didn't find it except through biochemistry and later other forms of genetics. So this complex binds to the centromeres of the chromosomes all the way down the length of the chromosomes. You can see a stripe. Worms are holocentric. They have a stripe-like chromosome structure for the centromere. So this complex is involved in mitosis and meiosis and proper chromosome segregation. This complex of proteins binds to the X chromosomes of embryos. And yet, this other complex of proteins here, which has four subunits in common with the dosage compensation complex, and differs from the dosage compensation complex solely by this subunit, SMC4, which comes from this complex, this complex has a completely different role. It, it has some role in, in chromosome segregation and mitosis, but, but more importantly, it actually controls chromosome structure and it actually helps to dictate where double strand breaks are made in the worm during meiosis in order to control where crossovers occur. So in other words, the same proteins create different complexes with very similar architecture, but these complexes have very, very different functions. So it's a very economical use of these different subunits throughout development. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the first example of chromosome changes and chromosome structure. I'm going to show you some movies for what happens when condensin 2 is lost. Condensin 2 is that complex that's responsible for compacting chromosomes for mitosis. And so just to orient you, although many of you are worm people, I just will orient you. This is a, um, an embryo. It's just been fertilized. This is the oocyte pronucleus, a sperm. These are the polar bodies. This, um, this embryo has obviously gone through meiosis. and you're going to see in the movies the first division. And what you're going to see is the sperm nucleus roaming over to the oocyte nucleus, and you'll see chromosomes compacting and separating. So sperm, oocyte, chromosomes compact. They line up on the metaphase plate, and they separate. And here's the cleavage furrow. And then you're going to see the next division. The chromosomes again compact. They line up on the metaphase plate, and they very clearly segregate. So that's the wild type uh, mitosis. And so what I'm going to show you is what happens when you eliminate one of the molecules in the condensin 2 complex. It's a panel of embryos, but you can see the chromosomes coming together. You can see they're kind of compacted, and they try to separate, but they really cannot. And so these chromosomes, in fact, have not been resolved from each other. They haven't been compacted properly, and they haven't resolved from each other. And a cleavage furrow comes in and actually um, makes it such that the chromosomes are still connected and the chromosomes still fight to see which cell they're going to end up in. So the cleavage furrow isn't really, really um, wonderfully formed, and what you end up having is a series of embryos with all sorts of aneuploidies, and so the embryo ends up dying. And this is the subunit in this condensin 2 complex. Okay, I'm going to now switch to dosage compensation, and I'm first going to talk about how this dosage compensation complex is targeted selectively to the X chromosomes and some of its function. And along the way, I'm going to tell you the cis and trans acting elements that are important. Um, at the end, I'll just touch upon the fact, but probably won't discuss it much, the fact that sumolation is critical for the dosage compensation complex to bind to the X chromosome. And then I'm going to show you changes in X chromosome structure that are affected as a consequence of the complex binding. And before I launch into this, I wanted to introduce you to the people who've done this work. These are a series of graduate students. Um, Becky and Will have done um, most of the work I'm going to describe to you on targeting of the dosage compensation complex to X. Christy looks at nucleosome structure and the relationship between where nucleosomes bind and where the dosage compensation complex bind. And Emily and Claire work on chromosome structure that changes as a consequence of the dosage compensation complex binding to X. Okay. So it's a daunting task to figure out before there's uh, chip, chip, chip seek or any other chromosome-wide approach to figure out where uh, binding sites are for a large complex of proteins. And uh, we took many approaches that netted us the uh, 
discovery of various chromosome binding sites for the dosage compensation complex, I'm only going to describe to you one such approach, um, which was pivotal to understanding the different classes of binding sites that the dosage compensation complex can bind to. So just to orient you, uh, the major binding sites that recruit the dosage compensation complex to X we call RECs for recruitment element on X. So uh, the most recent way we found these binding sites is this. One can do a series of chip, chip experiments and identify the peaks of binding of the dosage compensation complex. But then one has to ask the question, are these actual sites of binding that are sites that recruit the complex to X? Or are they sites that the complex can bind once the complex finds its way to the X chromosome? In other words, are they sites of binding, initial binding? Are they sites of spreading? What are they? And so what we did was we took DNA that was underneath these peaks and we put it back into the worm and we created what the worm does well, extra chromosomal arrays that are in a couple hundred copies. And we took fish probes to that array to identify where it was in the cell and then antibodies to the dosage compensation complex to see where that complex would bind and whether it would bind to the site. And so if it bound to that site of a predetermined DNA sequence, we knew that that site had to be a recruitment site, that when it was liberated from the context of X, it could bind the dosage compensation complex. And here you can see an example of such a region that when uh, put in, back into the worm, it recruits the dosage compensation complex. And here you can see this side here, which is equivalent in binding, that fails to recruit the complex when it's there, uh, liberated from the X chromosome. So this led to the notion of two classes of sites, these recruitment sites, and then sites we called DOCS sites for dependent on X. And the properties of these binding sites are very different. So for example, we've shown that the recruitment sites um, use a very specific DNA motif for many of those binding sites. So it's a sequence-dependent uh, DNA binding reaction. There are not that many of these recruitment sites. At most, there's 200. Really, there's probably between 100 and 200. These dock sites are about tenfold more prevalent than these recruitment sites. And these dock sites have the property that they are primarily in promoters, and in, particularly, they're in promoters of active genes. They follow transcription around. And they are dependent on X, and there is no sequence motif that we can find that is a distinguishing feature that lets us recognize in advance what one of those sites might be. Um, the sequence motif that we know to be pivotal for dosage compensation is this sequence here. It's a 12-mer. It's highly enriched on the X chromosome. If we mutate that motif in our um, sites, the binding to the sites is, is diminished completely. Um, we know that this is part, but not all, of the X sequence specificity, and recently we found other motifs that are important. But this itself is extremely important, just not the only thing that's important. The property of those dock sites, I told you, was dependent on transcription, and this is the most dramatic way I can show that to you. If you look at a gene that is expressed more highly in the embryo, then in the L1, and you look at the binding of the dosage compensation complex in the embryo and in the L1, what you'll find is that when the gene is highly expressed in the embryo, you see a peak of binding. But when the expression diminishes in the L1 larva, that peak disappears. In other words, the binding is dynamically dependent on transcription. Uh, that's true in reverse. If a, if a gene is poorly ex expressed in the embryo, there's no binding site. When it becomes more expressed in the L1, a binding site appears. That's true on X and autism. So what I haven't told you yet is although the um, dosage compensation complex has a preference for binding to the X chromosome, it can also bind to autosomes. It binds to autosomes at one-fifth the number of sites and at much less occupancy. But nonetheless, the rules for binding to these sites are very similar to the rules to binding to dock sites. There's no major recruitment sites on autosomes. The binding is weak, and it's always in promoters of genes, and it's also dependent on the level of transcription. When there's high transcription, there's a binding site. When there's low transcription, there's not, and that's true for embryos and for L1. So it's a dynamic binding pattern that's dependent on transcription. Okay. You might ask, what does transcription have to do with this? Is it simply that there is a region of open chromatin and that the dosage compensation complex goes right there? Um, we did a whole series of nucleosome studies in collaboration with Jonathan Widom's lab. 
and we mapped nucleosome occupancy in embryos, L1s, adults. We even did an in vitro reconstitution experiment where we took nucleosomes and put them on naked DNA. And the answer has been the same pretty universally, that on the X chromosome, there's an extra peak of nucleosome binding that's upstream in the promoter region. So this is a map of, trans of all genes on, on, on X. And this is the transcription start site for those genes, and this is the position of occupancy, the average position of occupancy of the nucleosomes. And this is the, the occupancy in the, on the y-axis. And you can see here, there's this peak of binding of the dosage of nucleosomes that's just upstream in the promoter, and that's not true for autosomes. And this unique feature of X chromosome, this extra nucleosome, is really common to worms. It's also true in the nematode C. briggsi. It's not common in mouse. It's not common in any other organism that we've noticed that has an X chromosome. And this pattern of binding is uh, the same as one can find if one reconstitutes um, the, same, the nucleosomes in vitro, and it's the same as one can find by predictions from the Widom lab that um, allow you to look at DNA sequence and decide whether or not a nucleosome should be there. So there's this inherent feature of the X chromosome that allows nucleosomes to bind upstream of promoters. In fact, that's exactly where the dosage compensation complex binds. So, of course, it's a question of how often the nucleosome is there and how often the dosage compensation complex is there and whether they can be there at the same time on the same piece of DNA, and we don't know the answer to that. But we certainly know that this is not a designed feature that, that allows nucleosomes to not be in that region. Nucleosomes are happily in that region, so it's not just a nucleosome-free region. So we have to think more. Okay, so, so far I've told you about the sites on X that are important for the dosage compensation complex to bind there. Now I'm going to tell you about the transacting regulators that drag the dosage compensation complex to X and the relationship between these recruitment sites and these dock sites. So our genetic analysis allowed us to know that in an XX animal when uh, the hermaphrodite mode is signaled, there's a very important gene called SDC2 that is turned on. And that gene, SDC2, is the uh, most important recruiter of the dosage compensation complex to the X chromosome. In a male, when the first gene of the pathway ZOL1 is turned on, it blocks the expression of SDC2, and hence the dosage compensation complex is not allowed to bind to the X chromosome of the male. If, by tricks, we let SDC2 bind to the X chromosome of the male, the dosage compensation complex will load there, it will turn down gene expression, and the male will die. SDC2 interacts with SDC3, a zinc finger protein, and dumpy 30 that compass component, to bring the dosage compensation complex to X. SDC2 itself is a 350 kilodalton protein. Its only distinguishing feature is a coiled coil motif, and we have racked our brains to try and figure out how this is so important in dragging the dosage compensation complex to X. So what I'm going to show you next is a series of chip, chip experiments in which we look in different mutant embryos to ask whether or not the dosage compensation complex can bind to recruitment sites and can bind to these dock sites. And I'm showing you just one shot and giving you the, uh, sorry, before I do that, I'm telling you that dumpy 30 is part of the dosage compensation complex. And as such, it binds to all the same sites uh, on the X chromosome as the dosage compensation complex binds to. The compass complex binds in a similar fashion, however, there are certain recruitment sites that it does not bind to. But for our purposes today, you just have to think that dumpy 30 is a part of the dosage compensation complex, and I'm going to show you that it's pivotal for recruitment. Okay, so this is the experiment in which we look in different mutant backgrounds. These are animals that are dead. These are XX animals deficient in each of these different dosage compensation genes. And we're asking what happens to binding to the recruitment sites and to the dock sites. So this is just one example. Here's a very robust recruitment site. And in wild type, you can see it. And the, the, um, the dock site is uh, many, many uh, nucleotides downstream of that. Um, this rec site, in the presence of a dumpy 30 mutant, SDC3 mutant, or SDC2 mutant, is not occupied. So these mutations are important. These genes are critical for the dosage compensation complex to bind to recruitment sites. So what happens to dock sites? What happens is that the level of occupancy goes way down. In 50% of the cases, the dock sites no longer exist. But in 50% of the cases, binding to the dock sites is reduced. And we think reduced revealing a level of inherent binding to those promoter regions that happens in the absence of the dosage compensation complex binding to the major recruitment sites. So in other words, we see SDC2 dependent and independent binding to these sites. And 
that's critical, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And that binding of the dosage compensation complex to autosomes is unaffected by these mutations. And in fact, the level of binding of the dosage compensation complex at these dock sites on X is very much the same as the normal level of binding of the dosage compensation complex um, to the autosome. So in other words, there's just an ability of condensins to find DNA. Okay, what's remarkable, in fact, is that if you look at where the dosage compensation complex binds in mutants that don't allow it to bind to rec sites, so that's here. There are these, um, uh, these are all, these are all um, dock sites, and these are the sites of occupancy in wild type. In a mutant that prevents down, upstream binding to rec sites, you see there's very little binding, but you can see binding here, you can see binding here. What I'm showing you here is the pattern of binding of this other condensin complex, condensin 2, which has no role in gene expression, has no role in dosage compensation, but it is a condensin complex. It binds actually to the same sites on autosomes as the dosage compensation complex. So that makes you think that condensins have, all condensins have an inherent binding affinity, oftentimes for promoters, oftentimes for tRNAs, and the dosage compensation complex has that as well. It's just that by being on the X chromosome and being there in combination with the recruitment site, the prediction would be that that's why these dock sites are occupied more fully. And so to test that, we did an experiment in which we took a fusion of the X chromosome to an autosome. And we asked whether the binding to the autosome was increased as a consequence of fusion to the X chromosome. If the model is correct that you bind to a recruitment site on X and that facilitates spreading or binding of the complex to these other weak sites, which on their own have very little ability to bind, then the prediction here would be that fusing the X chromosome to an autosome would enhance the ability of the dosage compensation complex to bind to the autosome. And that's exactly what you see. Here is the wild type autosome and you see these peaks of binding. They're not strong, but if you look in an X to autosome fusion, you see the levels of this binding to be increased. So you see old sites that had bad occupancy having more occupancy, and then you see the level of detection of binding um, for sites that you couldn't find before now elevated. So over a two megabase region, we find increased binding as a consequence of putting rec sites onto an autosome. So that's consistent with our model that all these sites, not the rec sites actually, but these dock sites, these promoter regions, have a low affinity for binding this dosage compensation complex and indeed any condensing complex. And there's a consequence of the sex determination switch that lets SDC2 be expressed exclusively in hermaphrodites and works with SDC3 and Dumpy30. The complex now binds to these red recruitment sites and then facilitates spreading into these other dock sites. I use the term spreading very loosely because spreading in this case can mean as far as 90 kb or bigger. And so this is not a local phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And one of the questions is whether the chromosome has to change its shape in order to facilitate binding of the dosage compensation complex from one site to the next. And in general, what the role is of chromosome structure. Okay, you might want to know what the mechanism of dosage compensation is, and I would love to be able to tell you, but I can't. All I can tell you is that we've done a series of experiments that show that dosage compensation actually works at the level of transcription. Before, we didn't know if it was the level of message stability, message degradation, transcription. We didn't know. And so we've done a series of experiments where we look in wild type and in dosage compensation defective mutants and ask where the different forms of polymerase go in wild type and in mutants. And this experiment has enough resolution for us to tell you that dosage compensation affects transcription. It does not have the resolution to let us tell you whether it affects initiation or elongation. So here's a series of genes down here. This is the wild type profile of polymerase. This is the form of antibody to the form of polymerase that recognizes all forms. You see in a mutant situation that now you see a lot more binding of polymerase in the promoter regions of these genes. When you look at the form of polymerase that is the initiating form of polymerase, you see bumps of binding of the promoters, and you see that level increase as well in our mutants. And when you look at the elongating form of polymerase, you find that the level goes up in our mutants as well. So that tells you that transcription is definitely being affected. Transcription is turned up in dosage compensation mutants, as you would predict for a mechanism in which the dosage compensation complex represses transcription. But again, we don't know at what level. 
it's transcription, but we don't know if it's initiation or elongation. And we're doing collaboration with John Liss right now to do GrowSeq experiments to figure this out in more detail. Okay, so does the dosage compensation complex affect chromosome structure? I told you where condensin-2 is important for condensing chromosomes in preparation for the mitotic and meiotic divisions. We asked whether the dosage compensation complex changes chromosome shape as a consequence of binding to it. So here I have for you the entire X chromosome laid out, and here's an example of some of the locations of the recruitment sites. Remember, there's about um, between 100 and 200 of these sites. I've only drawn a few for you. And in particular, I've drawn ones that we can act that are at different distances from each other. So these sites are 1.2 megabases apart. These are 12.5 megabases apart. We're going to ask the question of where in three-dimensional space a recruitment site that's here and a recruitment site that he is here ends up in the nucleus. Are they together? Are they far apart? Where are they? And this is an example of what we first did. So this is done by Emily Crane, and when she, when she first made uh, single copy fish probes to these recruitment sites, she discovered, much to our surprise, that recruitment sites that are far, far apart, encoded in a very large distance from each other in the genome, 12.5 megabases apart, that's almost across the entire X chromosome. Nonetheless, you can find the fish probes to these sites together and always at the nuclear pore. And it didn't matter what size uh, distance we looked at, we always found at some frequency these recruitment sites would come together. And so Emily um, created with Satoro computer programs to look in three-dimensional space and to quantify this kind of uh, reaction. I'm going to spare the details for how that was done, but I'm just going to show you some images of what you actually have to look at. This, these are not rendered in three dimensions, but you can at least see in two dimensions what it looks like if fish probes are uh, about 300 nanometers apart. You can actually see um, co-localization of green and red to see a little bit of yellow. 700 nanometers are slightly further apart, 1,000, etc. A worm embryo, a nucleus, is about 3,000 nanometers. So you can see these distances pretty easily, and you can render these uh, nuclei in three dimensions and then pick the, um, the points of the rec sites and then use these computer programs to, to, to measure the distances. And I'm going to show you some graphs of that. So first, I'm going to show you the three-dimensional space occupancy of dosage comes of these two rec sites that are only 1.2 megabases apart. And so this is a graph showing you the percent of uh, rex pairs that are at different distances. So this first bin is 300 nanometers. Remember, you can see co-localization. You can see a little yellow spot. This is 600 nanometers on down to about 3,000. And what I want you to notice is that for this 1.2 megabase uh, region, you see that about over 30 percent of the time, you get these recruitment sites together uh, on the nuclear pore. But you, you, we do controls. We ask whether or not in dosage compensation defective mutants or in exo-animals, whether those sites come together or not, and the answer is rarely. So in this case, at 1.2 megabases, one sees that the recruitment sites are able to come together at the nuclear periphery in response to the dosage compensation complex. Emily did this on a bunch of different pairs, and here's a summary. So this is a, the 1.2 megabase distance I showed you before. 35 percent of the time, they come together. So we imagine this is kind of a dynamic reaction. We don't imagine that once the rec sites come together at the nuclear pore, they stay there. They're coming on and off. We, we don't know whether the rec sites coming together facilitates binding to the doc sites or facilitates uh, gene expression, but we see a very strong correlation between binding and change in chromosome shape. And that change in chromosome shape depends on the distance those rec sites are apart. So this is a graded series for you, looking at rec sites that differ by 1.2 megabases, 3.9, 5.9, 9.3, or 12.5 megabases. And again, this tells you the percentage of time in an XX dosage compensating animal, how often you see these recruitment sites together. And what you see is um, as the sites are further apart, they are together less often on the nuclear pore. Nonetheless, all these data are statistically significant. And in all cases, what we find on the XX animal for localization of the two uh, uh, probes together is significantly greater than the localization in a dosage compensation defective XX or in a normal wild type exo animals. So in other words, we do see the chromosome changing its shape in response to the dosage compensation complex binding. So one needs to do some controls. What happens if you look at sites on the X chromosome that don't bind the dosage compensation complex? And here are two such sites. These are 9.6 megabases and 6.9 megabases apart. 
And what you see is that very infrequently, you, you rarely see these sites together. So it, it seems like the coming together of sites is dependent on strong uh, recruitment for the dosage compensation complex, and that it's also dependent, of course, in a sex-specific way. Uh, we also asked what happened on autosomes. So if you take equivalent regions, this is one megabase between these sites on autosomes and eight megabases. These are also sites that uh, actually have very weak doc ki docs kind of sites for the dosage compensation complex. And what you see is that you rarely see those sites coming together in either XX or XO animals. So the phenomenon we're describing seems to be X specific and it seems to be dependent on the dosage compensation complex. And so if you um, want to believe me, you may not believe me completely yet, but I want to give you one more experiment to make you know that we think we're pretty confident about this. So we intentionally placed recruitment sites in new locations on the X chromosome, places where they weren't previously. We then assayed the uh, change in shape of the chromosome as a consequence of putting new sites uh, on the X. And to our satisfaction, we found that when we put new sites, we increased the, the occupancy of a new site to a, an, to a different recruitment site. This is a newly inserted rec site that's 2.7 megabases from a rec site we had known before. And you see an increase in occupancy of the two sites together compared to that same location before it had a rec site. And so we can see changes in chromosome shape as a consequence of the dosage compensation complex binding. Uh, it's very important to figure out exactly what this means and whether or not this change in shape is causal to changes in gene expression or is causal to facilitating binding the dosage compensation complex. We don't know the answer to that yet, but we now have devised ways of eliminating these recruitment sites on the native X chromosome and putting them onto autosomes, and we're addressing this question now with reporter genes. Okay, so, so far, I've given you a hint of some evolutionary implications about where dosage compensation came from. We think that the dosage compensation complex was simply stolen from an ancient complex, the condensing complex, and that you can take an ancient complex like the condensing complex and specialize it for a new role in a, in a, in a different process. And we think the dosage compensation complex did that by replacing one of the SMC proteins that's important for mitosis with a dosage compensation specific SMC protein, W27. And in addition, the worm created a sex specific dosage compensation complex loader, SDC2, which is specific to um, XX animals and allows the dosage compensation complex to be loaded onto the X chromosome. So it takes one change in the complex and ident identifying and creating a new loader that puts that complex specifically onto the X chromosome. So we think that these condensed molecules could be doing many other things in the cell than what we now know and that you can adapt them for different purposes just by modifying components in the complex and how they get loaded to specific sites of chromosomes and DNA. Um, I also wanted to tell you that the dosage compensation complex acts over long range. We looked at where the dosage compensation complex binds relative to the genes it controls, and we discovered that there were many genes that were dosage compensated but had no binding sites in their promoter or within 20 kb of that gene. In other words, the gene does not have to have a dosage compensation complex nearby it in order to be subjected to the function of it. Secondly, we found genes that had the dosage compensation complex bound to the promoter, but in fact those genes were not dosage compensated. So the binding of the complex um, is neither necessary nor sufficient at the promoter. It has to be acting at a distance. It may also be acting locally, but we don't have evidence for that yet. I've shown you that the dosage compensation complex controls gene expression at the level of transcription, and that it can alter chromosome conformation, and we hope that it's causal, but haven't shown causal, to reducing gene expression. And I'm just going to mention that we've shown that simulation is pivotal for loading of the dosage compensation complex to X. If we get rid of the single molecule that encodes sumo, small ubiquitin-like molecule, the dosage compensation complex does not like to bind to the X chromosome. Instead, it enhances its binding to the autosome. So that modification is also important. So in other words, there are many different aspects that are important for binding the dosage compensation complex to X. I want to now turn my attention to evolutionary comparisons of dosage compensation. When you have that large a protein complex and those large of proteins that themselves um, don't seem to have specific features that tell us how they bind the X chromosome, 
uh, we thought it would be important to take an evolutionary approach and look across species to figure out whether or not the dosage compensation complex in related nematodes was the same. And so we turn to C. briggsi. C. briggsi is between 15 to 30 million years diverged from C. elegans, depending on what way you calculate it. And so we needed to devise technology in order to knock out genes in C. briggsi. One could do genetics in C. briggsi, but the genetics just aren't as facile as they are in C. elegans, and we were frustrated. So we turned to a separate approach. We, in collaboration with Sangamo, we have been able to achieve heritable site-directed mutagenesis in C. elegans using zinc figure nucleases. For me, this was a big deal. It was 20 years that I wished we could specifically ask that a gene or a cis-acting site be knocked out by some mechanism. And, and after 20 years of wishing, we finally achieved that. So what are zinc finger domains? What are zinc finger proteins? So zinc finger proteins are specific DNA binding domains that have rec a specific uh, sequence recognition on DNA. There is not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between a finger and a nucleotide. You have to do um, experiments to actually figure out what a zinc finger will recognize. There's partly a code, but partly not a code. And what you can do is you can fuse a zinc finger to a monomer of an endonuclease. This, this monomer, of uh, this endonuclease FOK1, is attached to one set of zinc fingers, and the other um, half of that dimer is attached to another set. And so when the zinc fingers bind to these opposite strands, the monomers come together and form an active endonuclease. And so the selectivity of where the zinc finger nuclease will bind is dictated exclusively by the sequence that the zinc fingers recognize. And you um, end up using fingers so that you have about a 24 nucleotide specificity for where you can um, actually place the zinc finger. This endonuclease makes a double strand break, and then in the worm and in most organisms, that double strand break is repaired through a non-homologous end joining that gives you insertions and deletions. Uh, this set of experiments is done by two amazing postdocs in the lab, Tay Wen Lo and Andrew Wood. And the trick to all of this was to make zinc for your nucleases and take the RNAs and inject them into the worm and look at their progeny of the worm. And we first tried this out with GFP. So this was a particularly reported gene. You're looking at gonads here. And this gonad here, these are the different oocytes. And uh, in this case, we have a, gon a gonad-specific promoter pi-1 that's fused to histone GFP. So you're seeing the nuclei of these oocytes. And when we first directed zinc finger nucleases to GFP, so we injected the finger nucleases, and we found, um, within two generations, we found that GFP had been knocked out. This is a highly specific, highly efficient reaction. And what we find are insertions, insertions and deletions at the site of the double strand break, and it's mediated by non-homologous end joining. So we wanted to work out the rules for this, and so we turned it to a resistance gene. Benamyl resistance, um, it, Benamyl, the Benamyl resistance gene is a microtubule gene. The worm in the presence of Benamyl is completely paralyzed. If you knock out the gene in only one copy of the gene, you can relieve the worm from its paralysis. And so we did an experiment where we injected the zinc finger nucleases into the worm and then collected animals over different periods of time post-injection. So this is zero to two hours post-injection, two to six, six to 10, et cetera. And we graphed both the number of progeny in gray and then the, frequ the, number of the frequency of mutations that came out. And that's in pink and red here. And what we found was that there was a very selective time window over which the mutagenesis occurred and over which we could actually collect mutants. And this was great because that meant that you could do your injections, time when the injections occurred, and collect your sample of, of animals in a very short window of time and then assay them to find out whether or not there is a defect. And so this is so efficient that our assay is to take a worm, grind it up, um, make DNA out of it. This is going to be a heterozygous mutant. We then let the, let the DNA reanneal, and we use an endonuclease, a cell one endonuclease, to see molecularly whether or not we have a, a, an insertion or deletion at the site where the double strand break was supposed to be made. And in fact, the frequency is so high that if we inject 10 animals and look at 200 progeny at most, we will be assured of getting a mutation in the gene we want. So it's highly efficient, and it's uh, great for getting null alleles or any class of mutations you want. Okay, so we turned this loose on C. briggsi. We had noticed that C. briggsi um, had the condensin-like complex in its genome, and it had many of the homologs that we knew were to be important in C. elegans. 
And we wanted to know whether dosage compensation had been conserved over 30 million years. And so Tang Wen Lo first made antibodies to both MIX1 and WB27 and asked whether or not they bound to the X chromosome and then proceeded to use zinc finger nucleases to knock out genes. And so she showed that, this is C. Briggsy now, that WB27, which is that SMC, dosage compensation specific protein in, in C. elegans, in C. Briggsy, it binds to the X chromosome. You can see X chromosome fish here, and you can see the overlap of the dosage compensation complex and the fish. You can see that in the merged image. This is true for WB27 and for MIX1. Uh, uh, Taewin showed that the binding of the dosage compensation complex to the C. Briggsy X is specific to the hermaphrodite. So this is a hermaphrodite. The complex is loaded. You see this spot, these spots on the X chromosomes. This is a male. The dosage compensation complex is not loaded. So it's a sex-specific process. And she then asked whether the molecular machinery for loading this complex to X was the same and whether the targeting sequences on X are the same or have they diverged. And so just to remind you, in C. elegans, the pivotal loader of the dosage compensation complex is SDC2, that 350 kill Dalton protein that has no homology to anything but has a large coiled coil region. And what controls that is ZOL1. ZOL1 is turned on in a male to turn off SDC2. So Taewin used those zinc finger nucleases to see Briggsy's SDC2 to knock it out and ask the consequences. And what she found was that when she knocked out SDC2 in C. Briggsy, 100% of the XX animals died, the males were normal, and the dosage compensation complex failed to load onto the X chromosome. So that said that this protein, which is actually only 20% identical to the C. elegans protein, is conserved in function. She wanted to find out if the hierarchy for loading the complex was conserved to the extent that the major sex determination switch gene, ZOL1, was also conserved. So she looked at that. And what she found was if you knock out ZOL1, all the males die, and they die because the dosage compensation complex gets loaded inappropriately on the X chromosome. We've now switched to embryos here. These are little embryos. This, these are gut cells. These are embryo cells. You can see these blobs. These are actually the X chromosomes that are bound by the dosage compensation complex. In a wild-type XO animal, you don't see binding. In a ZOL1 mutant, you see the X chromosomes occupied by the dosage compensation complex. And so clearly, uh, in the absence of ZOL1, the complex can load inappropriately to the X. So T1 wanted to know if the hierarchy, the genetic hierarchy, was the same. So she wanted to do a genetic epistasis um, experiment, but she didn't really want to make the double uh, by having to do normal genetic recombination. So she um, asked whether she could take zinc finger nucleases and apply them to this ZOL1 mutant and knock out SDC2 in that background and, and see whether or not SDC2 could now suppress the male lethality caused by a ZOL1 mutation. So she just turns zinc finger nucleases to SDC2 loose on a ZOL1 XX animal. And then she discovered, yes, indeed, that um, if she makes a double, ZOL1 SDC2, the males are now all alive and the dosage compensation complex fails to bind to the X chromosome. In other words, the major targeting machinery, SDC2, is conserved. The switch genes, all one, which I haven't told you but will tell you, is actually the target for uh, the counting of the X chromosomes. Uh, when there are two doses of, of X chromosomes, obviously ZOL1 is turned off. When there's only one dose, ZOL1 is kept on. And so that is conserved in C. Briggsy, between C. Briggsy and C. elegans. But then she wanted to know if the DNA sequences were the same. And she discovered that the major recruitment factors on X are different. And so this is just a diagram in which we've analyzed where this motif that's enriched on the C. elegans X chromosome, we've analyzed whether or not it's also enriched on the C. Briggsy chromosome. So this is a graph where you see the fold enrichment of this sequence, this consensus motif, on X compared to autosomes. And this is just the probability number, the probability threshold of whether a particular sequence is a good or bad match to this consensus. It's a consensus sequence. Obviously, you can have different changes in the sequence, which could still facilitate binding. And this just tells you the, that here, where the scores are minus 18 or such, these are better matches the consensus sequence, and these are worse matches. And on the C. elegans X chromosome, you see an enrichment of this motif on the X chromosome. And anything above a match of minus 14 or better is actually 100% predictive of where the dosage compensation complex will bind on the X chromosome in C. elegans. Um, C. Tengwen found that, in fact, these motifs are not enriched on the C. Briggs X chromosome. 
leading to the view that this is perhaps not the X specific factor that recruits the dosage compensation complex to the C Briggsy X. But then Ting Wen did an experiment where she asked whether she could take the recruitment sites from C. elegans, which have these motifs in different consensus matches to the, Mex, the major Mex motif. She put those sites which bind well in C. elegans into C. Briggsy, and she asked whether they could bind in C. Briggsy by this recruitment assay I described to you before, and the answer was no. So that the major recruitment sites that we find in C. elegans do not function in C. Briggsy. And so from that we conclude that the sequence preference for how the complex binds to C. Briggsy X has diverged over evolutionary history, and it must imply that there is a comp compensating change in the proteins that bind to the DNA, as well as the sequences on X that, that recruit the complex in. So over time, the machinery is conserved, but the targeting mechanism has diverged. Okay. I've given you a whirlwind tour of dosage compensation, and I just want to end with a few remarks on changes in chromosome structure that are important to mediate where you place a double-strand break for crossover control in meiosis. So thus far, I've told you about condensin-2, which you saw in movies too, which is important for compacting chromosomes for mitotic divisions. I've told you about the dosage compensation complex, and now I'm going to tell you about this complex of proteins which deviates from the dosage compensation complex by a single subunit. SMC4 substitutes for done between seven. Okay, in, in, as you know, in meiosis, uh, diploid progenitor germ cells are, um, go through two rounds of division and become haploid gametes. And uh, the work I'm going to show you is work done by Dave Metz, a graduate student, and Chun Tsai, both wonderful students. So um, meiosis, you all have the wonderful Michael Lichten here who thinks about meiosis and probably tells you about it all the time, and um, I admire his work and uh, wish I did some of it. Anyway, so meiosis, this is a case where you're looking at a single homologous pair of chromosomes, one's in purple, one's in blue. The chromosomes are replicated, they have to pair, a synapsis occurs, there's a crossover. That crossover is pivotal. Not only is that crossover uh, useful for genetic exchange of material, perhaps even for evolution, even more important, and perhaps even the most important reason for a crossover, is that it helps the homologous chromosomes align at the metaphase plate and attach the spindle in an orientation that lets the homologous chromosomes separate properly. And so the first meiotic division separates the homologs, the second meiotic division separates the sisters. Of course, this is a, an animal, and you get polar bodies. So in fact, when you do recombination studies in the, in the worm, you have to be mindful of the fact that for every meiotic uh, set of divisions, you get one and only one good gamete. OK, so Anne Vilnev and others earlier, but Anne Vilnev primarily, discovered that in C. elegans, there is one and only one crossover per homologous pair of chromosomes. That's pretty unusual. Most organisms have multiple crossovers per homologous chromosomes. What Chun Tsai was able to discover, much to our surprise, was that our dosage compensation mutations disrupted that rule. And in fact, in our dosage compensation mutants, but unrelated to the process of dosage compensation, as I'll argue, uh, crossover control is abrogated to the extent that we find more crossovers than you would normally see in the wild type. You see multiple crossover events. And this was intriguing to us because this, I think, was the first time one actually saw multiple crossover events in a systematic way across all chromosomes in C. elegans. And we wondered how these proteins, which are condensin proteins, might affect that change. And so uh, in the simplified version of meiosis, uh, in order to get a crossover, you have to make a double strand break, and then there's multiple steps that mature that double strand break, either to a non-crossover event or to a crossover. And what I'm going to tell you is that the way that this condensing complex seems to control where the crossovers go is that it controls where the double strand break gets placed. And so this condensing, uh, this condensing complex is important for determining, at least in part, where you can place double strand breaks. And so We've done all our assays in two ways. One is using RAD51, which is a single-strand DNA binding protein that binds to early double-strand repair uh, crossover intermediates, and tunnel assays to find out where double-strand breaks are. And, and what we've been able to show is that, in fact, this complex changes double-strand breaks. And so this is an example, one genetic example, of how the genetic map of a chromosome changes in response to losing one copy of one subunit of this complex. 
And so here is the map of the X chromosome. These are molecular markers in uh, red. And here is the number of, um, these chromosomes are assayed individually, and all the SNP markers are looked at individually on individual chromosomes. And so if you look at 94 chromosomes in the wild type, you see 42% have one crossover. Remember, in meiosis in an animal, you have those polar bodies, so you only actually expect to see 50% of the chromosomes having a crossover, so this is not abnormal. We see no double or no triple crossovers. We've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. This is just one, one experiment. In our mutant, Dumby 28, first I want you to notice that the map seems to change. This marker here and this marker here now get really close together. That is, the genetic distance between these, these two markers shrinks. Uh, by comparison, this marker here and this marker here undergo more recombination, and the genetic map increases. So not only do you get a shift of where the crossovers occur, you get an increase in the number of crossovers. So here we have, again, 40% of the uh, chromosomes having one crossover, but now we have 15 out of 92 chromosomes having double crossovers and, and two having triple crossovers. In other words, this, this mechanism of tight control seems to have been um, changed. And so uh, Dave Metz did a really important experiment to ask, when you change the location of crossovers, do you also change the location of the double strand break? In other words, is the location of the double strand break dictating where those crossovers occur? And so he did an experiment in which he uh, labeled mitotic chromosomes wild type or mutant with an axis marker so you could trace the entire X chromosome, and, or all the chromosomes in three dimensions. He had uh, the rad 1 foci labeled. He had fish markers so that he could identify where on the X chromosome, for example, the double strand breaks were relative to the crossovers. And so in this case, um, the red marker here is a fish probe that's right here on the genetic map, and the blue is a fish marker that's right here on the genetic map. And so we knew in this mutant, this is a non-null mutant, one that changes the distribution of crossovers. What Dave found was that in this mutant, which was different from the null mutant I showed you before, in magnitude but not in, 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 in result, this region here is greatly compressed, even more so than the null. And in fact, he saw almost no crossovers between these intervals. And this interval here was greatly expanded. And so he then asked, because he knew exactly where he could map the double strand breaks, how the double strand break location varied with the change in crossovers. And what I'm showing you is the location of the double strand breaks. And so what he found in the wild type was that between this interval A to this blue mark here, 44% of the double strand breaks occurred, and that's pretty close to the frequency recombination you get. Here there was 50% of the um, double strand breaks were in this interval, and here there was 6%. And he looked in the mutants, and this is the non-null mutant, and what he found that corresponding to the fact that recombination shrinks in this interval, the double strand break number goes from 44% down to 3%. And the double strand break number in this interval, which increases in crossovers, expands to 80%. And this interval goes up to 17%. In other words, exactly following where the crossovers were was the shift in location of the double strand breaks. So the reason I'm telling you this experiment is they want to know whether the chromosome structure was altered as a consequence of mutating this complex. And the answer is yes, and it's very dramatic. And again, it's another correlation between changes in chromosome shape and dramatic change in function. So as I said, Dave is able to image chromosomes and render them in three dimensions and then trace them. And once you trace a chromosome, you can use a computational program to lengthen, to, to straighten it and look at distance size. And so this is the size of a wild type X chromosome. It's uh, 0.55 um, micrometers. But in our mutants, our mutants are half one phenotype. Losing one copy changes crossover number and distribution. And you can see the chromosome expands. And you can see that in the homozygous null mutant background, the chromosome expands even more. And so we see a dramatic change in chromosome shape, as it, or chromosome size, as a consequence of mutations in this condensing complex. Um, it's true of all chromosomes. So this is chromosome one. You also see a huge change in a half-low insufficient manner. This is not a property of disrupting dosage compensation because this dosage compensation specific mutation um, does not increase axis length. Um, it is independent of double strand breaks. If you get rid of all double strand breaks in the organism, you still get an expansion in chromosome size. So 11 is the molecule that makes a double strand break. 
If you put extra double-strand breaks into the worm and get extra crossovers, that also does not change the length of the chromosome. In other words, it seems to be a property of this complex. It is not a property of double-strand breaks, or increasing or decreasing them. And moreover, every single component of this complex that Dave discovered through biochemistry has the same effect. In a haploinsufficient way, every single component of the complex, when mutant, causes an expansion in chromosome size. So is this causal? Of course, we don't know if it's causal, but the question is, can we co-suppress the expansion, excuse me, can we co-suppress the <coughs> expansion in chromosome size and the um, change in the number of crossovers and double strand breaks? And the answer was yes. <coughs> so here we have an experiment in which Dave mutated this axis protein HIM3. HIM3 is a homolog of the yeast axis protein HOP1. And what Dave found was that um, the mutation itself does not change chromosome length or size or structure, but if you pair that mutation in combination with the mutation that does change chromosome shape, you see that not only do you restore chromosome shape or chromosome size back to its normal size, you actually restore the number of double strand breaks and the positioning of double strand breaks to normal. So the fact that you can co-suppress uh, the axis length and the uh, number of crossovers and the position of crossovers simultaneously makes us encouraged to believe that there is a causal relationship, and in particular, the changes in chromosome structure, and perhaps how axial proteins bind to the DNA, or what's causal to changing where the double strand machi break machinery can come in and make double strand breaks. I think what's most remarkable about this is the fact that you can have a single mutation making a huge change in crossovers. Uh, this is then, uh, of course, taught by the discovery of zinc finger protein in the mouse and in humans that if you mutate it, you can also change the distribution of crossovers in humans and chimps. It's a remarkable finding and leads to the, the fact that one thinks about crossovers and double strand breaks. One has to entertain the notion in a very serious way that forces other than histone modifications or specific DNA sequences at a local site are controlling where you place double strand breaks and where you place crossovers. And in, in particular, in C. elegans, this is a very dramatic case of where a condensing complex, which varies from the dosage compensation complex by only one subunit, has this remarkably different role of changing myotic chromosome shape in order to change where you place double strand breaks and where you place crossovers. And with that, I want to end my talk, only two minutes over. And you're probably exhausted from all these words I've used, but I'm happy to answer questions. If you have a question, please use the microphone so we can all hear it. I'm going to get out of the light. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. The most challenging question, I'm sure. So, so this actually isn't quite a question about meiosis, but given that the condensin-1 complex and the dosage compensation complex share all these subunits, do they also share the subunits that you identified as being involved as loaders of the do yeah, dosage? No. no, they don't. Okay, they fine. do not. Then so, I don't have a question. So the, the loaders, we think the loaders for, for the meiotic condensin must be different because our the loaders for the dosage compensation complex do not affect myotic crossovers. Okay. So there has to be some other way they get to the chromosomes. Okay. So I actually do have another question, okay. which actually has to do with the fact that you showed that these REX sites are closer to each other under conditions of dosage compensation than they are um, uh, under conditions non -dosage of non-dosage compensation. Yeah. So is that additive? In other words, is this happening over the entire length of the chromosome, or are you looking at sort of pairwise combinations that so, are right. different in different parts of right. the population? It's a very important question. We've looked at pairwise combinations. What we're doing now is looking at multiple fish probes simultaneously. And what we find at some frequency is that all the fish probes come together as a crowd. We're only looking at a few fish probes because we only have so many channels. But but certainly, the fact that we saw every pairwise combination coming together made us think that there must be some sites where multiple rec sites come together, and that turns out to be true. And, and it also turns out to be true that nuclear pore complexes immunoprecipitate the dosage compensation complex. And it also turns out to be true that some nuclear pore com complex components 
bind to those recruitment sites. So we think we have going on here a very tidy mechanism for um, helping the X chromosome fold up and perhaps also helping the recruitment sites be occupied by the dosage compensation complex. So I have a kind of naive question and I'm, it may be because I'm sort of mixing up some of the features of the various dosage yeah, compensation or condensing <laughs> complexes. But I'm just wondering if there's any known mechanistic connection between you know, what you're studying and um, the role of the Caesar one argonaut, which has recently been shown or suggested to bind to RNAs and promote yeah, chromosome so segregation. We, um, we look at a lot of different factors that can influence dosage compensation and loading of the dosage compensation complex. And what we discovered is that Caesar one when mutant, screws up loading of the dosage compensation complex when we put it in combination with a very weak dosage compensation mutation. So yes, indeed, Caesar one is somehow important in this process, and we don't know how, and we've also shown that a component of the microRNA pathway does the same thing. And so this is all sort of new and mysterious to us, but yes, there's a connection between small RNAs and the pathways and dosage compensation. Do you know that if they bind the same genes, at least on the genome-wide um, level? We, haven't, uh, we have not seen the ChIP-seq data on Cesar, but I am told that it's different. They've seen our data, we haven't seen theirs, so I'm pretty sure it's different. So I have a couple of questions about the translocations that you mentioned at least uh, briefly. So do, do rec sites communicate across those uh, translocation breaks, break points? Do you get them coming together in the nucleus? We haven't. So your question is if we have like um, X attached to an autosome. So what we haven't done yet is insert a rec site at the two megabase point that is inward to the autosome to ask whether that rec site, that new rec site, now comes together with the rec sites on X. We haven't done that experiment yet. Nor have we planted, we've planted individual recruitment sites onto autosomes on different locations, and now we're crossing them together to ask your question. Okay. And I don't know what I expect, because if you only have two rec sites on, on, on autosome and, you know, 200 on the X, there may not be enough dosage compensation complexes to go around and have an impact. So, we're doing the experiment, but we may have to actually put multiple rec sites. We don't know the answer yet. So do you have enough uh, traditional kind of X autosome translocations? Are those tolerated well? Do they act they like duplications? Well. Or, so uh, ironically, and maybe this is for a good reason, the, most of the translocations are on one side of the X chromosome, not the other. But so far, the obstacle is this. Um, the number of dosage compensation complexes is limiting. <coughs> such that if you have three X chromosomes instead of two, the animal doesn't dosage compensate. But if you have a big duplication of X attached to an autosome, it also titrates the complexes off X, and so X is not dosage compensated properly. So the reason that translocations are not tolerated so well is not because of um, extra, it's because the complex is limiting. And if you have a big duplication, the animal hates it. Okay, just a reminder, <clears throat> refreshments down the hall. Let's thank Barbara again.